Hello and welcome to the Capital Games Podcast. I am the Wiz. And I'm Zero. Zero. Uh I had something and I just lost it. Shit. <laughs> anyway, we'll move on. Um so Zero, I know that we talked beforehand, you're not playing much, but you are consuming some media that is interesting this week. What are you consuming that is game related? So uh, this week is a, the um, is the week of uh, Summer Games Done Quick. Um, it is a charity held by the Games Done Quick uh, Foundation, where um, they try to raise money for um, Doctors Without Borders, and it's a bit of a cause that's important to me because um, in a previous life I was a healthcare worker for near ten years, <clears throat> and Doctors Without Borders they do superb work especially since um just they're an ngo so they just uh they don't have any things like um insurance bureaucracy to deal with so just the importance of their work can't um i can't even begin to state how important it is so um and funny enough um a, a mutual friend of ours on my discord server uh she uh she and uh, and their um, late partner who passed away last year, they were the ones who got uh, me into watching Summer Games Done Quick uh, nearly a decade ago. And ever since ever since that, uh, it's been just a yearly tradition for me to tune in, um, at least try to donate uh, donate some money to Doctors Without Borders, and just watch some just amazing speedrunners just kill through games that uh, I've spent hundreds of hours in. Um, hell... Uh, just before we started this podcast, um, they finished the Yakuza Like a Dragon speedrun um, in about four and a half hours. And oh, wow. that is a massive game. And for anyone who wants perspective on how how long it took for me to kind of casually just play through the game, it took me nearly 48 hours to beat Jesus. the game. God. So, yeah, just to, just to cut a game down from a casual playthrough of 48 hours down to four and a half hours. It's just absolutely staggering stuff. And what they do, it's all speed runs, right? So they're not, all it is is a bunch of people playing random games and beating them as fast as they can for records, right? Or are they, or do these records count for like, um, a governing body? Like, uh, what would be one? Um, shit. What's the name of it? What's the name of the company that does all the speed running records for video games? The Twin Galaxies. Thank you. Yeah, um, okay. it's um, uh, well, uh, the governing body for um, the Games Done Quick um, Foundation has always been Speedrun.com. Okay, and that's mostly because that uh, there's peer reviewing for all the speed uh, for all the speed strats and everything. Okay, so um, that's that's why just um, you have uh, you have. Uh, basically, speedrun.com uh, as the as the point of verification and everything. Hmm. So um, it's it's real neat and everything uh, overall, um, especially just because um, in some cases there have been some streamers that have just completely shattered records live on stage, and it's and when that happens, it's just kind of one of those things that it just blows your mind because you're you're just sitting there going, oh my god how in the world did he kill that score it, it, it's insane yeah so it's one of those things that's just so neat to see and um i think i think that's really what makes it just so fun just um when you just watch something that you may have played for hours and hours and hours and maybe even played multiple times and then you just see this person who gets on stage and they're like oh yeah you know i'm gonna I'm gonna kill this game in, in, um, in this time, and then you're you're sitting there going, "No way! I spent 120 hours doing every single side quest and so on and so forth, and this guy's gonna do it in in seven hours? No, that's impossible! That's insane!" Mm -hmm. And then you're just kind of enthralled just watching the the spectacle. Yeah, are these tool assisted, or they use a lot of glitches in most of these, right? Um, really depends on the speed run because um, there have been people who submit speed runs that might say something like glitchless, one hundred percent, no no exploits of this type, and so on and so forth. It just kind of runs the gamut, and uh, typically during during um, 
I think the final day, that's when they usually have a tool assisted speedrun exhibition where they just show the task bot just completely crushing games in ways that no human could ever play. Hmm. Um, like one year they had they had um, a task exhibition where just um, this computerized robot program um, demolished uh, Super Mario Brothers in I want to say four minutes. It was absolutely bonkers stuff. Hmm. So um, yeah, just that's always fun to see. So you know if um, if you're in the mood for if you're in the mood for stuff like that, then yeah, it's really fun. All right, that sounds cool. Um... Is there a, a, a link or something for to donate to Doctors Without Borders for it, or is that on the Twitch page when you watch it? Um, you can go to gamesdonequick.com, mm -hmm. and there is a donate button, so you can just donate uh, that way. If you watch on Twitch, you can actually donate your Twitch sub, which um, Twitch actually does not take a cut of the bits that uh, the bits and um, subs that are donated to the Games Done Quick channel, so they get they get 100% of the amount That's good. from Twitch as well, too. Um, and then, of course, uh, they are partnered with um, the Yeti uh, for, like, T-shirts and merch and stuff, which um, ha I believe it's either half or a third of the price of the item um, does get immediately donated to uh, Games Done Quick for Doctors Without Borders. But if you're kind of into more nerdier uh, gaming-related paraphernalia, then uh, there's always Fan Gamer, and Fan Gamer, I believe, has the same sort of setup like the Yeti, where um, if you purchase any of the merch that they have posted in their Games Done Quick store um, on Fan Gamer, then it's either half or a third of the purchase price goes towards um, uh, being donated to Doctors Without Borders. Okay, so if you're interested, go uh, to that website and donate and watch some cool speed runs. Okay. We'll move on. Um, so, Zero, Monday we finally got the announcement that there was a Nintendo Direct that happened uh, today, which is Tuesday. We record on Tuesdays at 9 a.m. Um, now, for those who aren't familiar with what, what's been going on, um, we discussed it briefly on the podcast. Uh, and basically... What what happened was two weeks ago during the the Summer Games Fest week that that was an announce a rumor started circulating uh, that a Nintendo Direct was happening at the end of the month. Um, the person who started the rumor essentially was Alana Pierce, uh, formerly of IGN and a Funhouse, and she has her own YouTube channel and she's a writer for. Sony Santa Monica, uh, but she let the cat out of the bag that there is an uh, there is indeed a Nintendo Direct happening this month, and when she confirmed when she said that it was happening, there was a knockoff effect by a bunch of YouTubers and journalists that said, "Oh yeah, we all heard the same thing; it's happening." Which, um, I don't know. Well, let's let's talk about this first because before we get into the Nintendo Direct itself, um. When the announcement was made, I was really surprised by how many YouTubers and journalists just jumped on the bandwagon immediately and said, oh yeah, I heard the same thing, it's true. Not really questioning where the source was coming from, how this person knew it, and why it, why the information was so trustworthy to a certain extent. What, what did you think when the uh, the rumor was first, first started circulating? Um, as far as my initial thoughts, um, my first initial thought was, okay, well, you know, um, not to be a Debbie Downer, but, you know, it's kind of, um, the information should be treated as a little bit suspect because she, she works for a competitor. She right. works for Sony Santa Monica. So, you know, she may have been reliable as a journalist in the past, but, um, now that she works for a game studio, she literally works with, um, uh, with the uh, with the interest that uh, that is more interested in profiting their bottom line and also protecting their own secrets. Or you would think that really that, uh, and people should be skeptical of that. I, I understand that people like her, 
and people have trusted her because of what she was with IGN and with her YouTube channel, and I get that. But you need to have a critical mind sometimes and think, wait a minute, this person works for a competitor. Why does she know this information? How did she get it? And why is she letting this out there like this? I mean, you can... you can. It's fine if you want to think she meant nothing by it other than she was excited. Fine. But then on the other hand, I I thought two things in this. Either one, it was kind of nefarious that she was trying, that she was announcing this to get hype up, who then, then disappoint, who then would disappoint fans uh, that week with Nintendo, because p- fans are usually not very well in critical thinking. They hear the announcement, they anticipate it, they expect it, and when it doesn't happen, they don't get pissed at the people who are wrong, they get pissed at the people that they thought should have done it. But the other the other thing I, I kept thinking was, okay, but if she's right, and she helps Nintendo get two weeks of buzz before Nintendo Direct, and the Nintendo Direct turns out to be a killer Direct, wouldn't she get into some trouble with her higher ups? Wouldn't she have issues at work for helping a competitor? The, like I, I just, I just sat here, th- just kept questioning, like all of these things that, but no one was questioning this at all. No one was saying this is kind of suspect. We should really be taking a back seat here and thinking, wait a minute. Uh, there's more about this that we should be discussing instead of, ooh, Nintendo Direct. I I just came out of this really disappointed with... Mo- <laughs> this would be a first. Not much the journalists, but the YouTubers specifically. Because they fell for it hook, line, and sinker. And they basically hyped this up for two weeks, thinking this was a general Direct. Which, spoilers, it wasn't. It was a partner Direct. That was a, a Nintendo Direct Mini that it ended up being, which is fine. But if everyone was so sure this was a Nintendo Direct, why did they not disclose that this was going to be a partner Direct? Like, if they were so certain of this. So. Yeah, and and uh, ultimately, at, at least for me, just my, my thought ultimately just came down to, you know, just, just hey, um, I get it. You know, just, just, um, you, you guys really want to jump in on, on, um, I guess, uh, for lack of a better way of putting it, um, you guys want to jump on the hype train because if this is, if this is in the mind share, you, you want to be, you want to be able to hit the YouTube algorithm and, you know, just, just end up, end up on the hot streak and everything. I get right. it. But at the same time, if, if you're, if you're trying to be a video game um, journalist, um, it doesn't matter if you're on YouTube or not. Um, you you still have an in, you still have an integrity to uphold to your viewers, and and you're supposed to you're supposed to do your damn duty and just report responsibly, not mm-hmm. not just fall into the hive mind of hey, well this is what the algorithm says everyone wants. We gotta we gotta do exactly what the algorithm says. Yeah, I mean when we discuss this. I mean, I was so certain that there was not going to be a direct, and I, and technically, I was wrong. There was a direct. However, the mentality that everyone had in the two weeks prior was this was going to be a general E3 direct that they're used to uh, at this time, and this entire time I was like, that's not happening. Like it, it's like they first off. Nintendo announced a bunch of games uh, in, I think it was March was the last Direct? Well, am I, um, I might be wrong on that. But in the last Direct, they announced everything from that time to September, which I think the latest one was Splatoon 2. And it would be silly for them to have that Direct, but only announce games from that point to September. Like I or from that point to October, which it would have been completely redundant. So uh, at that point, I was like, "No, nah, that doesn't seem right to me." And every year they have a September direct for the fall and the spring 
of the following year. So it, it to me, I looked at that and went, no, I don't think it's happening. And then you mentioned at one time too, uh, today, uh, the day we're recording this, is their shareholders meeting, which during a shareholders meeting, you, you don't want to have your stock price jump or fall because of a Nintendo Direct. That would be a terrible idea. So that was another reason why, and I'm, I'm giving you credit for this because I didn't think about this beforehand until you mentioned it, but that's another reason why we both thought, no, that's not happening. And you know who else thought that it wasn't happening either? There's a YouTuber called Kit and Krista, and these are the old Nintendo Minute people who work for the Nintendo Treehouse. And that's something you also showed me, that basically they're saying, yeah, the Nintendo Direct that you're expecting is not happening, and here's why. And I I didn't get a chance to actually watch the video, but the comments on it was hilarious, because they were all like, oh, you're going to look stupid when it turns out there is a general Nintendo Direct. Like, these people would know! Come on! Yeah, they they specifically work for Nintendo, yeah. so they know they know a lot of the Nintendo protocols and procedures, and and yeah, just um, especially when it comes to stuff like uh, potential potentially um, potential information that could affect a stock price. Nintendo is not really going to want to break laws because just in multiple countries, um, withholding. Um, financially significant information before a stockholders meeting is technically illegal. Yeah, and and I mean I'm not just talking strictly strictly for the uh, for the U.S. or anything. Mm-hmm. I'm talking about just countries all over the world. I know Europe, it's illegal in Japan. Japan. Yeah, um, I believe it's illegal in Taiwan as well too. Which um, I think that's where some of the Nintendo stock from Japan is being traded. So yeah, there are just multiple issues with just. Just those who are just like, oh yeah, you know, it's it's totally one hundred percent confirmed that you know just this direct is going to happen, and it's just like, yeah, you guys aren't living in reality. It's just yeah. like, I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to be the guy that pisses in your cereal or anything, but you know, just there, there is, there is a a method to the madness, right? And when the, when Kit and Krista came with their video. Okay, saying yeah, it's not happening, and here's why. Do you know how many YouTubers and journalists caught on to it? None. Zero. Zero. <laughs> In fact, after they did that, um, specifically, I, got, I think it was Spawn Wave had his third predictions video with different people on YouTube. Or was it second? I don't. He's had multiple ones. He had one that was an hour long about a few days after it was rumored. And then this past Saturday, he had one with a couple of people on his channel as well. So he did, he double dipped on this and he, but he, and he was using it and he was framing it as this is a general direct. We're expecting Metroid prime. We're expecting the new donkey Kong. We're expecting, and I'm listening to some sitting here. You, you have no ground to stand on on this. What are you doing? And I know what they're doing. They're just they're just feeding into the hype to get more clicks. And they're never going to be like, well, yeah, sorry guys, we were wrong. They were like, well, we were we were led to believe it was this, but it's actually this. No big deal. And then move on. And if someone criticizes them and says, yo, you were wrong, why not own up to it? Like, you're supposed to be a, a trusted source or a journalist or something. It's like, well, I'm not a journalist. I'm just a pundit. I'm just, I just cover the business. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't consider myself a journalist, so I don't have to abide by that, which is complete bullshit. Because if you're covering the business and you want to be a trusted name that people should listen to, you do have to have due diligence in saying, hey, you know, I, like this is what's happening. Here's the information. Here's maybe why you shouldn't believe it, but here's why I believe it. And then if I'm wrong, I think you'd get more respect if people would. If you said, "Yeah, I I kind of miss, I shot my shot and I was off. So sorry." Like I think they would respect them more if they would have just been out like, "Yeah, we thought this and we were wrong," but they're not going to do that. So like. 
that oh. and, and I want to reiterate, and I think you agree with me. I have zero issue with Alana Pierce like uh, outing this because if she had the information, and and her to me it was like she had the information. It wasn't a big deal. She had it. She didn't see that it was a problem to have it and to and to and to state that she knew. So she she talked about it. I don't think it was really anything nefarious. I think it was as simple as, oh yeah, this is common knowledge, and she just said it. Now, yeah. in I I think this will be the last time you hear her say this, because I, deep, I, I'm telling you, someone has to have told her that's not a smart move, because. Like I, I doubt she's gonna get in trouble with this because this turned out to be a kind of a dud. But if this turned out to be the best general direct of all time, and it helped Nintendo gain more market share, I can see a Nintendo exec going, "Wait a minute, one of ours hyped this up for two weeks. What the hell is going on here? Why?" And she would be in some trouble. So yeah. I, I think I think this will probably be the last time you're gonna hear her talk about this openly. Honestly. Like I I, I think at least. So Oh yeah. Just um if um if it was a third party studio that was rather close with Nintendo, mm -hmm. I could see this potentially jeopardizing that relationship and whoever told her probably has either lost their job or or was warned uh, was warned that hey um, by doing by doing a thing that you did, you you almost caused me to lose my job. So, I I can't talk with you about this sort of thing anymore. I don't I don't know with a third party unless this wasn't except for the Ubisoft the Ubisoft game that was in that, the uh, Sparks of Hope the Mario Rabbits <laughs> game. These were just all third party. So I don't know if. I would I would agree that possibly the person that leaked it to her probably is in some kind of hot water, but I don't think they get fired because I don't think no, Nintendo. Uh, I don't think Nintendo. Nintendo, would... Go Nintendo has had a history of of getting real angry and huffy um, with anyone who um, who ruins a direct or anything. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. that's where that's where really my perspective is coming from um, from the fact that you know just. Uh, Nintendo has had a has had a has had a previous history of getting very very pissy when someone just um, steals the thunder right out from under them when they had a really big direct that they were just ready to just share a shit ton of hype to the world and everything. Yeah, but this wasn't a general direct. This was a partner showcase of all third parties. So I don't think, and this was a mini. So I, maybe Nintendo is a little pissed about this. But I don't think they're going to be that pissed. It's not like... I mean, Mario and Rabbids is technically a Nintendo game. Technically. and they they I, and they But it wasn't the main game on the Direct. So I, I don't think the person that leaked it is going to lose his job. I think he'll get into some trouble if it's found yeah. out. But yeah, I, I think... Well, again, like... The issue here isn't Delana Pierce. It really isn't. Like it, the fact that she came out with the uh, the information. It, it just seemed to me was like, oh, what's the big deal? Not yeah. probably not realizing that it kind of is a big deal actually. But I, my issue is with the people covering it and just taking her word for it and say, oh, if she says it's good, then definitely it's happening. But. But like, but not taking into consideration. But wait a minute, she works for Sony. How would she know this information? And if and she specifically said the information did not come from Nintendo, so that would have been the hint of, oh, this is a third party thing. This isn't a general direct. Yeah. So I don't know why anyone didn't come out with this. Didn't come out with it and said, hey guys, this may not be a general direct. This might be something else. So maybe not hype it up as much, but no one said that, especially in the YouTube. Like I, okay, I generally like to praise YouTubers because most of them do a decent job, but there are some out there that are just constant hype mills, 
And one of them I didn't think was that way was Spawn Wave until this time. And at this point, I'm kind of annoyed by him because he really milked this for two weeks. Like every news wave, like the 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 epi- the one hour episodes of predictions with other YouTubers. It just was like, Jesus Christ, dude, you don't even know what's going on. But you're predicting all these grand things for your viewers who trust you into thinking that you know something, when now clearly you don't. So, yeah, I, I'm like, I have no problem. Like, I think I've made it abundantly clear. I have no problem criticizing journalists when they do wrong and do stupid things. I clearly have no problem doing that with YouTubers either, because clearly YouTubers have been making themselves out to be the, the antidote and the, uh, the alternative to games journalists, but the the games journalists made them look really silly because I only I only remember one or two who were like really hyping this up, and the rest of them were kind of like sitting back, going, "Yeah, we'll see," <laughs> and they looked good in this by just holding back and let everyone hang themselves by their own rope. So, yep. Anything you want to add to that before we get into what happened on the direct? Uh, no, um, pretty much just I'm basically in agreement with you that this should have been just a wait and see. Don't get your hopes up and just all this needless hype of, I swear to God, it's going to be a general direct. We're going to talk about, about uh, Metro Prime 4 and, and Bayonetta, uh, Bayonetta 3 is going to be talked about. I swear to you, it's going to be good. It's just like, like uh, yeah, just... You might you might want to be a little bit more responsible about your reporting because, as if 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 things disappoint, then they will disappoint. <laughs> right. I mean, just like like a lot of these YouTubers were like, "Oh, it's confirmed!" Like you have to trust this one source that everyone knows about. Like, no. <laughs> like it wasn't until like what was it, a day or two uh, before the announcement were. Other websites are reporting, yeah, this is not a general direct. This is a partner showcase. So, and still they were doing hype videos. So I was like, okay, you guys really aren't paying attention. So whatever. Okay, let's move on and talk about the direct. So the direct was a third party direct. It was 25 minutes and it was, yeah, it was all third party. So I think it's, uh, I think we should also make clear that even though that these were announced on Nintendo Direct and on Nintendo Direct, most of these are coming to other consoles too. So, uh, except for probably Mario and Rabbids, of course. But I think the vast majority of these are multi-platform. So why don't we start with, I guess, what stood out? Uh, Zero, what did you think stood out from the announcements? Um, Didn't stand out for me, but I know it stood out for a lot of people the confirmation that persona um three portable persona 4 golden and persona 5 royal Mm. were finally coming to switch yes a a lot of people have been asking for this and finally it's happened and i just want to i i did this on the discord with you and i just want to really cement this statement for everybody in prosperity so when I'm wrong, you guys can tell me I'm wrong, and I'm an asshole, and I'm stupid for thinking this. So here we go. I'm not even going to wait for sales for Persona 5, 4, and 3. I'm just going to come out right and say it. These will sell big time, and these will sell really well on Nintendo's platform. So well, in fact, that Nintendo will go to Atlas and say, we want Persona 6 as an exclusive for one year, on our platform and they will do it and they will have it for a year on that platform where you, the only place you can play it on the switch, uh, you you can play persona six is on the switch. I am, I am betting that now I am basically taking my, sticking my claim and saying, this is what's going to happen because the sales are going to be so big for persona on the switch that, that Atlas will look at this and go, why not? This this actually would be a great idea. And for those of you saying, well, they just made it multi-platform. Why would they do that? Because you'll buy it on another system. 
all of you who've already bought Persona on PlayStation are talking about how you're going to buy it for Switch. So yeah, you're going to buy it. <laughs> so they're going to, they are already have the mentality of, oh, people will buy it. Sure, if it's good, they'll buy it. And you've proven it. So that's why I think they'll get the exclusive. They'll get extra money for making a Nintendo exclusive. It'll be there for a year. It will sell well. And then it will be multi-platform uh, after that. That's that's my prediction with that. Yeah. And, I mean, it's... In my mind, it's definitely a, a fair thought, too. Because, yeah, if, if the sales end up being just astronomically crazy, and yeah, just... They're not going to ignore it. They're they're going to look at that real hard and go, "Shit, we we got to talk to Nintendo about some sort of exclusive partnership or yeah. something because just these numbers are fucking insane." Yeah. And Nintendo normally doesn't do that unless they have a, an ownership stake or they put money into a project like they do with Bayonetta. But I can see them making an exception here. So, like, well, no, that's not true. They do exclusives with Monster Hunter now. Like, Monster Hunter is exclusively a Nintendo property now, I think, right? Like um, they, the mainline Monster Hunter games, um, currently, yes. Yeah, so I can, I can definitely see this being a possibility. Um, yeah. That, that's, again, I'm, I'm shooting my shot out there and just saying this is going to happen. Maybe I'm wrong, but... It's not fun unless you, make, unless you take a risk, so let's move on. Um, Near Automata was announced, which surprised me for the Switch. And Oh, yes. That one genuinely was surprising for me as well, too, because when I saw, when I saw just um, the scenes from Automata being shown off, I was just like, yeah, watch, this is going to be something stupid and disappointing. It's going to be like, hey, guys, it's the cloud version. Aren't you guys happy? And then for the collective groaning of the world to yeah. go, oh God, why? Just, just screw off, Square Enix. You guys yeah. can't seem to do anything fucking right. Yeah, but it, it's not the cloud version, is it? It's, it's a, it's an actual release that they're doing, correct? Yep, it is okay. a one and true bona fide version. Now I'm surprised by this because um, near Automata. I mean, one. Well, I'm not surprised because tech. It's not a technical powerhouse. It's not a. It's not a real beautiful game. It's good looking, but it's not like intensive. But this was a buggy game. This is a game that did not optimize well on most systems. So, unless they did a lot of work to make sure it's going to work on a Nintendo Switch, which is an underpowered system, I was kind of surprised that this was announced. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, like I said, for me, I was just expecting just the rug to be pulled pulled out from under me and just just see an announcement, cloud version, and me to go, God damn it, Square, when will you realize no one cares about these cloud versions? Yeah. Just stop. <laughs> yeah, you, you're really hung up on those cloud versions, huh? <laughs> well, I mean, the fact that Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, which are basically PS2 games at this point, are being uh, are being sold as cloud versions for oh, Switch. Oh, I, I agree with you. That's ridiculous. That's, that's yeah, terrible. Yeah, it, it just hacked me off, and I was just like, watch, just that's going to be Square's grand release plan. Oh, multi-platform games? We'll just do cloud versions for Switch because we're too, we're too goddamn lazy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, to be pleasantly surprised with, hey, this is a- an actual native Switch version. I was like, my God. You're learning. <laughs> yep. Uh, okay. Um, I guess we'll move on from there. Um, what other announcements got you? Uh, you know what? Okay. Dragon Quest Treasures was shown off, which... Yes. I know you knew about this beforehand. I didn't. And your comparison was pretty apt that it, this is a, I guess, a mix between a treasure hunting game and monster and, and Dragon Quest Monsters. Yeah. Which... Uh, for those of you who don't know what Dragon Quest Monsters is, that's their Pokemon version of Dragon Quest, essentially. So, yeah, like uh, that sounds interesting to me. I, I can go for that. Yeah, and um, um, as I'd mentioned to you, just uh, this was talked about in, I believe, one of the Japanese um, Nintendo Direct presentations, but was not shown off in one of the, the Western ones. 
-hmm. So to see to see this being announced, saying, "Hey, it's actually coming out to the West," it was it was one of those moments. I was just like, "My God, yes!" Just I'd been hoping you guys would bring this out because I love the Dragon Quest Monster games. So disappointed that. And there were some um, at, at Dragon Quest Monsters games that did not come out on the DS um, to the West and everything. So to see a Dragon Quest Monster style game arrive to the West, it was just like, thank you. You realize that you finally realize that there are Dragon Quest fans outside of Japan, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. I mean that's an interesting announcement. I don't. Uh, that's probably gonna be multi-plat. Like almost all of these are probably gonna be multi-platform. So if even if you're not interested in buying games for Switch, these will probably end up on PS4, PS5, Xbox. So just keep that in mind. Um, one that stood out to me was Lorelei and the Laser Eyes, and mainly because it reminded me of Killer Seven with the art style. Yeah, that one looked really cool and. Yeah, uh, um, the the animation being being reminiscent of Killer Seven is is an interesting mention, especially since just that is one of Capcom's unfortunate games that has been forgotten. <laughs> well, that was meant to be a, a one off, wasn't it? Like that was uh, Suda Fifty One just basically doing one game. I don't think yeah. that was meant to be. Uh, that wasn't meant to be a franchise. That was meant to be a one off. So I, I'm not no. surprised that they forgot about it. It just had no opportunity to be a, a franchise. So, yeah. Um, another thing that I actually was surprised by and was really happy to see was the uh, Mega Man Battle Network Legacy Collection. Now, they announced on there that if you buy it digitally, it's gonna be it's gonna be sold in separate volume. So it'll be volume one and volume two. Which basically sounds like it's going to be sold that way uh, as well physically. Which to me would make zero sense because you can fit all ten games that they're they're releasing on there onto one cart, no problem. So I don't. That's weird. I don't. I don't like that. But I'm genuinely excited to get the Battle Network collection on there because those are decent games. So, and I, I don't have to worry about buying those carts for like twenty to thirty dollars a pop, which is great. So happy about that. Let's talk Sonic Frontiers. They they showed this off again, and they showed one cool part in the uh, in the um, in the show in, in the uh, the trailer. But the more and more I watch this, the more and more I'm like, they gotta delay this. Like this needs work. Like at yeah. least, at least a year's worth of work to make this look better, because even the combat looks janky, and I'm just like, Ugh. like, like obviously, you have issues if you do like Sonic games. I'm sorry, but it's true. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding, but but um, when actual Sonic fans, people who legitimately think Sonic Forces is a good game are saying to them, please delay this. <laughs> that should be the hint for Sonic, to, for Sega, to basically be like, yeah, maybe we should work on this again and get this better before we announce it. But there's been no announcement. Uh, even when they've been asking, are you delaying this? They've said, no, we're not delaying this. It comes out in 2022. Get ready. So I'm like, oh, all right. <laughs> that's yeah. that's going to be great. And it's funny because um, in in this little showcase, they showed the uh, concept of the cyberspace areas. And yeah. the cyberspace areas are essentially just um, the traditional Sonic Adventure style levels. And it was just like, at least in my mind, my thought was, why did you not show this off early during that, that whole IGN showcase? This would have been a great way to, to win over uh, some of the skeptics um, who are longtime Sonic fans because... You know, just a lot of them had had concerns that you know, hey, this looks this looks really bad. This looks like just a glorified Unreal Engine demo. Just why why are you showing this to, off to us like you're proud? Because it looks terrible. Yeah, and and now it's just 
the question that I had as well. And I mean, I'm not the biggest Sonic fan. I like the games. I like the games enough, but yeah, just for me, it just really baffled me. It was just like, why? Why have you not shown this? This is this is something that would have alleviated a lot of the skepticism a lot of the, um, a lot of folks had because a lot of folks were just like, you know, this looks like a bad bad demo. Why would you be proud of this? This right. is this is terrible. And, and some critics are saying, well. This isn't a finished demo. This is like a four. This might be a slice from like when the game was 50%, 60% done. Okay, maybe. But you then still have to look at the demo and go, this doesn't look good. Like this, there's clearly pop up issues. There's clearly issues with uh, foliage not looking very great. There's. It's it, it's still an empty space. the The combat still looks janky. Uh, movement looks off. The way that Sonic loses his rings when he gets hit looks weird. I mean, you would have to really objectively look at all this and go, "This is not going to look well when we show this off." So why don't like why don't you not wait until the game is I don't know eighty percent done, where it actually looks close to supposedly what the game will look like when it's finished and then show it off like that. I don't understand that because if a lot of people are saying, Oh, clearly this isn't done. It's in a rough state. So you you have to give it a grain of salt with that. Not really. If you're going to, if you're trying to use this as a reason for people to be excited by this, because if you're trying to show this off and say, you should be excited by this because look, then you're basically just saying, oh, that's the best you got. Oh, ew, no. So, I don't know. I I think they should delay the game, honestly. Oh, yeah. I'm, so. I'm still in the camp of, yeah, this should be delayed, but, you know, just, um, it is what it is, so... <laughs> yeah. Um, some re-releases and ports were announced, uh... Uh, a remake of Pac-Man World was announced uh, called Pac-Man World Repack. I, I never played Pac-Man World, but I've heard decent things about it. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, of course, we've been talking about Nier Automata is coming out uh, as a port. Uh, the Portal Companion Collection was announced. And I think that's a decent... That's that's cool to have on there because... First off, Portal is one of the best games ever made. I sadly have not played Portal 2, so, but, anyway, um, but, yeah, to have that on Switch, great, that's awesome. Of course, the Persona games were announced, uh, a sequel to Bomberman R was a surprise, because Bomberman R1 did not sell very well at all on any console, so... Yeah, yeah, that one was strange for me because it was just like Super Bomberman R was not a big seller, and um, I think really what made things worse was uh, the fact that when Super Bomberman R had came out, it was just Switch only, and unfortunately that also sort of um, hamstrung everything mm. um, because the multiplayer just wasn't there. So naturally, just just um, it was tough to get multiplayer lobbies going, and then they decided to just go multi-platform with it and release it on on Steam, on PS4, on Xbox One, in hopes to try to drum up some interest, and didn't didn't do too well there. And then they released a free-to-play version of Super Bomber Super Bomberman R, which actually recently or um, was recently announced that they'd be shutting it down soon. Yeah. So, yeah, just Super Bomberman R has just had a complicated history. Right. Um, for lack of a better way of putting it. Yeah. So, yeah, I was really surprised by that having a sequel. Anything else that stood out for you? Um, let's see here. I'm trying to think. Um, Blanc looked really cute for a narrative game. Yes, so. that looked decent. So that one was curious. Um, Little Noah's Scion of Paradise um, had sort of an interesting concept. Um, 
it's a roguelike that's got like a Pokemon element to it, where yeah. the monsters you collect can help you attack and defend and stuff like that. And it shadow dropped today on the eShop for the price of $15. That's not a bad price. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, if if you're into that kind of thing, that's kind of neat. Epic announced that they would be bringing a train simulator called Railgrade, which I was just like, okay, well, guess for people who like trains, that's kind of cool. <laughs> hmm. um, Legend of Right, uh, or RPG Time Legend of Right, that looked neat. Um uh, with the whole pen and paper aesthetic, so, so um, don't know how it'll play um, when it comes out and everything. So, so there's that. Um, Harvest Stella really had my interest because um, I'm a big fan of Rune Factory. Yeah. So uh, just um, seeing that Harvest Stella was kind of going for the Rune Factory feel, I was just like, okay definitely interested and the fact that it's coming out in november is great since um usually my family will have a big thanksgiving gathering so um and usually just i can only be, um i can only be around my family for so much before i need a break mm -hmm. so a game like harvestella is going to be great to just be able to dive into for a little while to to kind of reset myself and everything yeah i mean like Harvestella actually gave me Artillier vibes, but yeah, it does look interesting to me too. So yeah, and um, I do want to add something kind of fun um, for anyone uh, who's listening to this podcast and maybe a, a bit of an import nerd. Um, the Japanese Direct had one game that was shown off that was not shown off in any of the uh, Western English language directs. Um, they are getting a home port version of an arcade game called uh, Fishing Spirits Aquarium. And just that game just looks so fun. And I'm I'm not e even into fishing games, but the premise is, um, uh, from, from the trailer and everything is um, you basically play um, the a, a home version of um, Fishing Spirits Aquarium where you use your Joy-Con like a, a fishing rod to fish up all sorts of um, different... Uh, different um, uh, aquatic species and everything. But um, when you capture them, you can actually fill up your own kind of collector's aquarium in the game. So eventually you end up filling out the aquariums with like sharks, squids, whales, and whatever other aquatic creatures and everything um, to fill up your aquarium. And then on top of that, there's even a multiplayer mode where you can have like uh, your friends and family kind of co-op with you to get like the biggest specimen and everything. So, so you got that sort of stuff going on. And then later in the trailer, they also show some um, Mario party style, like party games. Uh, so like one where uh, um, you and your friends are on a ship and it gets attacked by a giant squid. And you're trying to basically just subdue the giant squid from, from attacking your ship. There was a mini game where you and your friends uh, ride on jet skis away from like a giant tidal wave and it just looked really fun and really neat. And the price isn't bad. It's um, it's being priced at um, forty one hundred yen, so about forty bucks, hmm. um, roughly, uh, with uh, with accounting for the uh, currency exchange rates right now. So um, I may actually look for that on Amazon Japan and maybe pick up a hard copy of it. <laughs> okay, cool. All right. Um, overall. This was a decent direct. I mean, this was a decent partner showcase. Nothing too exciting. I mean, we all we all pretty much figured that Persona was going to be announced on this. So, and we were all proven correct on that. But um yeah, like a decent direct, I I would say. Uh as long as you kept your expectations in check, think not thinking that a huge announcement was was going to be made. So, yeah, I mean, I have no issues with it. But those who are expecting a huge, big thing, I think we're going to be pretty disappointed. But yeah, yeah, decent direct. Yeah, overall, I thought it was fun. Yeah. Okay, let us move on to our next topic. Um, Zero, as much as it pains to me for me to say this, and as much as I actually like the game, Halo Infinite has been kind of a disaster for 343. And... It's losing people constantly because of how they're drip-feeding their content. 
I think their newest pass is six months long again. So that's another six months of just having one pass and not enough content. Um, the reason why we mentioned this, because this is not new news at all. Everyone knows this at this point. It looks as if 343 is now going to implement microtransactions on one game that hadn't had microtransactions that has been out for years now. And that's the Master Chief Collection. Uh, they uh, Was it announced or was it a rumor? I think it was a rumor that they are going to implement a currency that you can grind in the Master Chief Collection in order to get different types of skins and cosmetics. Um, what did you think about the announcement about them doing this and about them doing this specifically on, uh, or that they're exploring microtransactions on the Master Chief Collection? For me, I, it just sort of had me scratching my head, but at the same time, um, the other part of my mind was thinking about it going, actually, I can see why, why they're tempted on doing this because, um, the Master Chief Collection seems to have a consistent population as far as the multiplayer matches go. That's right. So, um, so likely, so, so the, the pragmatic business um, side of me was just like, oh, I know why they're doing this. It's because just they were hoping everyone would jump on Infinite and just start buying up everything in the, in the cash shop, buying up credits for the battle passes and whatever, whatever all else that they were going to have as money sinks. And, Unfortunately, just just um, with all the all the managerial screw ups with the handling of infinite and the multiplayer uh, stuff just being so bad that um, they just didn't have the the dream payout that they were hoping for. So yeah. now they're just going they're having to go, hey, well, what's an idea that we can do to you know consistently generate cash flow? And I'm guessing somebody had a bright idea and said, well, you know, the Master Chief Collection seems to get a consistent player account. Why not? Um, why not? Maybe we should consider something that lets us build out a um, build out a framework that we can um, sell microtransactions for, you know, do battle pass seasons, just something so we can try to uh, try to profit where we were supposed to profit with um, Halo Infinite. This really smells of desperation, really. It, it really just shows that they didn't have a consistent plan for this. I don't know who decided to, A, break, this, break Halo Infinite apart into a uh, free-to-play multiplayer and a single-player campaign, but clearly they just did not have the right framework in mind when they did this. And the fact that and and look, some are going to defend them by giving them six months to to do a uh, the battle pass by by just because they don't want to grind constantly grind and constantly uh, crunch their staff to get new content out. And I understand that. However, by doing that, you still need to have enough content to keep people in there if you're going to make it free to play. So I I definitely understand not wanting to grind your employees to dust, but you still need to have a good plan to keep people engaged. Because as cool as it is that you don't want to grind and crunch them to death, gamers are not going to care. They're going to... You can say that all you want, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, that's cool, and they'll go to a different game. They'll just play something else. But they'll 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 uh, clap and celebrate you for a few seconds. Say, oh, it's cool that you're doing that for your employees. But you're going to then end up having to let go of those employees because it's not making sales. So you, they have to have a more consistent... Uh, like they have to be more consistent on their battle passes and getting new stuff out on the game. They just have to. And, and the fact that they've also been breaking apart their their releases of like Forge and Co-op and stuff like that uh, also just shows that they 
they just really had bad management in this entire time for this game. And, and the game is good. It plays great. It's fun. But, yeah, even I, I got bored with it after a while of grinding the pass. So I, in the end, like, I, I think when Lost Ark came out, I just stopped cold turkey and haven't looked back. And there has been nothing for me to say, oh, yeah, that looks interesting. I, I want to go back and play that. Like, I think they announced one new mode and one map for the next six months. What is that? That's that's not enough. So you've got, I don't know. I don't know if you need to hire up more people or you have to get a better process down. But you need to update this much more than what you're doing right now. And, yeah, it's... Like, the only thing that up, it's updated constantly is the shop, essentially. So, yeah, like, they they bungled this big time. And the fact that they yeah. are... And the fact that they're think- going to Master Chief Collection to say, well, we have enough people who have that. Let's just s- stick microtransactions in there. That's going to be a very unpopular move. That's going to piss people off. So I I think that's the wrong move. I just think you should just take the the resources you have and just devote it to Halo Infinite and and get content out faster on that cuz that's what you desperately need. Just by then siphoning off people to go back to Master Chief Collection to put microtransactions there is not going to help you with Halo Infinite. Because apparently Halo Infinite is supposed to be the thing that's supposed to cover uh, 343 for the time being. And if they don't cover themselves, I wouldn't be surprised in five years if they're not around anymore. And and uh, Halo goes to Activision, essentially, to, to make a Halo game. So, yeah, well, they got to do something. Yeah, and um, I think really for me, just um, the the uh, the mismanagement of uh, Halo Infinite is it's just been bad. Um, I know I expressed this on on my Discord server personally, but um, the shop just has constantly rotating items because they're preying on people with the FOMO uh, to basically go, "Hey, I got to drop everything and buy this one thing," and they. Um, they really don't have any sort of evergreen cosmetic items, and there's one there's one cosmetic that I feel that they should just make evergreen at this point because just um, when it initially was sold back in December of last year, the the internet went completely mad over it, mm-hmm. um, mostly because it was the it was the most cutest thing ever, and just there was so much so much fun and meme potential in it. And that was the um, the cat ear armor set, <laughs> which gave you cat ears, uh, a helmet that had like cat ears on it, a uh, I believe a um, a piece of chest plate armor, and then a special a special color that went with this whole armor set. And every time that it's gone on sale, I've missed it. And mm-hmm. it's just one of those things that you know, um, in my opinion, you, you want more sales for for um uh, halo infinite i know i know one quick way that you easily get people to buy stuff from the cash shop make the make the cat ear armor set an evergreen item and say something like you know um half the proceeds of the sale of this cat armor go to a national no kill shelter organization yeah that'd be awesome Boom, easy just yeah. easy cash <laughs> and yeah there are some fans who are like well it's not that's not integral to the the uh, the story of Halo, and it just cheaps. It. No one cares, okay? <laughs> no one cares because yeah. people, when they saw the samurai armor, were like, "That's fucking awesome! That's cool! I want that!" Yep. And so, the samurai armor is another cool piece of armor that I would uh, I could see being like an evergreen thing. Yeah. So like, you should have more creative armor. Like, you should have more creative stuff that people can deck themselves out with and make it interesting looking. That, that's the point of having a free-to-play service is so people can express themselves in all sorts of armor that they'll purchase. Perfect. There you go. But they're not doing it. They're, they, 
just say, yeah, we have six months planned and we'll cycle off the same things for the next month or so. Yeah, okay, great. That's going to get people excited. Sure. Okay. But they, they honestly, they need to cut their their passes in half at the very least. I'd say in thirds. I think three months, I think three months is too long for a battle pass, but I, I don't know how long Fortnite's is. I think Fortnite's is usually two months, right? Are, are, do we know, or, or are we both? I, I don't play Fortnite. So okay, I neither do I. So, yeah, all right, never mind. But I doubt that they they do it for six months. I, I'm betting it's like maybe a month or two, maybe three, depending. So I... I, they they need to get a re, get the reins in on this, and their next season has to blow people's minds in order to get people back. Because if it doesn't, this is it's going to be too late for this to move up. So they need to do something in order to save this. Because they're now at a point now where I think was it, did I see it on Twitter that. Master Chief Collection has about 7,000 concurrently, and Infinite has like 2,000 concurrently right now. Like, that's, yeah. that's awful. That's really bad. So, yeah, yeah. They, they need to do something. And, and it's drastic that they have to do. So, even if that means hiring more people or whatever, but do something because what you're doing isn't working. So, yeah. Anything to add? Uh, no, just, um, I just feel that there's just some gross mismanagement of the game, which is a damn shame, uh, for Infinite, that yeah. is, mostly because just, just, um, I think with better management, Infinite can be great. Right. Infinite can be fun. And, but, and, go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, but clearly just, there's some sort of management issue, and because there's a management issue, it's just it just trickles down and just causes just this effect where just no one wants to care about this, this game, even if it is fun, even if it is good. Yeah. Just no one wants to care about it mostly because of the fact that just it's not, um, it's not in a great place and yeah. it's, and it's really a shame. The nature of free to play is that the game being fun is not enough. You also have to give them reasons to keep playing. And if people can grind out a pass within a month of a six month pass and get all the and get all the stuff that's on there, you have a huge problem because then that's five months where no one's playing that those specific people are not playing. Um, yeah. Like I, I, I'll for example, I play MLB the Show. I think we if people who've listened to this for God knows how long know that by now, but they constantly refresh updates. They constantly have battle passes that are free, number one. And number two, they have them for like three weeks, two weeks, a week. And they keep refreshing content. They keep adding new missions, new cards, new players, new uh, cosmetics, things like that that you can earn. Like they constantly update the game. And that's enough, especially for me, to say, okay, I'll keep playing the game as long as you keep giving me all this free stuff and these updates. So, yeah, cool, I'm good. And that's all they need to do. But they're not doing it. So someone needs to really take a look at everything and look at the business plan and model and say, this needs to change, it needs to change now. And if it doesn't, I mean... Zero. If Halo Infinite was a big deal, if it if it was popular and people loved it, this could have single handedly helped Xbox Series X and just been like, oh well, Halo Infinite's there and everyone's playing that, so it's kind of okay it has no games because I have Halo Infinite. Like that could have saved them a lot of grief, but because it didn't turn out very well, they're kind of screwed at this point. So yep. yeah, especially since um, it just seemed like uh, everything was riding on this because I think I think Halo Infinite was supposed to be like a ten year plan sort of game. Yeah, and the fact that it's just not doing well, it's just like that's not a good sign. That's no. that's a that's a terrible sign of uh, of things, especially if uh, 
if you guys were planning to uh, stretch this thing out for 10 years, you, you guys don't really have a great plan right now because it, it's kind of in shambles right now. Yeah. So, I don't know. Do you have any other ideas of how they can improve this? Or are they just screwed at this point? At this point, I would say they need to back off their idea of just going going back to uh, to Halo Master Chief Collection. Yeah. And, and redouble their efforts on Infinite. They uh, And I think one of the things that I've uh, read is just they don't seem to want to listen to the player community oh, God. about what the player community thinks is wrong and that's just that's just bad i yeah. mean in uh, i should be one to talk i used to have an abusive relationship with um with uh destiny 2 mm. with just the constant uh, the constant cycle and and it's sad to, it uh, it's a little bit sad too because of course um the joke, the joke has always been, and that, uh, uh, what's it called? When, uh, when you played Destiny Two, there's always a cycle. There's, there's the everything is good period, where just everything is good, everything works fine, um, everything seems fair, and then you have the update that happens that changes everything, and yeah. then when that update happens, things get broken, um. Uh, weapons get nerfed. Some get unfairly buffed. Um, things like Crucible and and uh, Trials of the Nine are completely screwed up. Just uh, it ends up being a real painful experience. So that leads to the player community griping and saying, uh, telling Bungie, "Hey, why did you do these things? It's not fun to do the things that you did." Yeah. And then of course. Um, Bungie sort of sort of dismisses it and uses the excuse of, of, uh, uh, gosh, what's it called? Oh, you're playing the game wrong. Um, uh, you guys aren't playing playing the game properly, so that's why the game is not fun. And then, then, um, it leads into the coping cycle with the player community going, "Oh God, it's it's all lost." Bungie no longer wants to listen to us. Um, they hate us. They, they'd rather they'd rather us go choke and die. Um, there's no hope, but we'll try to protest in vain in hopes that you know, oh maybe Bungie will listen to us. And then finally, a Bungie then makes another update with a with an admission of, hey, we might have screwed up. We might have done some things that the player community absolutely reviled or detested, but um, we apologize and we love your forgiveness so can you all find it in your heart to forgive us yeah. and then just the cycle starts over again so just um they uh, if they if they can actually do better and listen to the player community then they won't have a situation like destiny where just it's just a terrible and endless cycle of pain suffering and agony yeah now destiny 2 if i recall correctly well this is when i was playing it they have a three month battle pass, right? It's it's a three months, right? Am I right on that, or am I off? Uh, no, um, that was correct when they were doing the battle passes. It was always around three months. Hmm. Okay. Oh, they're not doing the battle passes anymore. Um, I think they are. Just I haven't kept up if it's still a three yeah. month thing or if it's or if it's a hey, um, we're doing it for six. I mean, so, no idea. <laughs> It's funny, Destiny 2 might be the thing they should look at and say, yet yeah, do this. <laughs> you know, like do except for the whole uh take away the game take away the content that I paid for, please. Take don't do that. But do what they're doing. They they seem to get it. So yeah, um yeah, I mean they're in tr some trouble and they need to they need to fix things. So we'll see whether they We'll see whether they decide to put microtransactions in Master Chief Collection, which the smart thing would be, no, don't do that. Yeah. But anyway, we'll move on. Um, so an announcement came down uh, from Activision that basically when Overwatch 2 is released free to play on October 7th, that if you own Overwatch 1, it will you'll not be able to play it because they're shutting that down completely. 
this flies in the face of when they were talking in the beginning of saying people who have Overwatch 1 we will play against Overwatch 2 players. It'll be the same game. You'll be able to play it no matter what. But they walked that back, essentially, and said, no, we're shutting it down uh, once Overwatch 2 is uh, there. Um, Zero, how do you feel about Overwatch 1 being shut down when Overwatch 2 free-to-play comes? Um, it's a bit of an interesting move. I mean, just um, I get it. They want to get everyone over to the brand new hotness and everything. Mm-hmm. So it's one of those things that, you know, I, I get the intent. But at the same time, it also does kind of stink too because um, they basically tell everyone, hey, we, we, we basically want you to move over to, to Overwatch 2 because, well, we can start exploiting you for the, the new battle passes that we're doing. Um, it's, it's very apparent. It's right. definitely very, very apparent. Right. Um, I would have a big problem with this if Overwatch 2 was not free to play. But because it yeah. is, and apparently your skins and stuff are coming with you when you go to Overwatch 2, I'm okay with it. But I do understand why people are like, that's kind of fucked that you did this, you said you wouldn't. And now my disc is a coaster, apparently now. But that's kind of been what gaming has become in the past two console cycles now. Your disc essentially is just an installation key. That's all it is. So at this point, like, it doesn't surprise me. Um, But since Overwatch 2 is free to play... If you really want to play Overwatch, you're going to download Overwatch 2. I, I don't find this as objectionable as some people might. Do I understand? Yes, that, that kind of sucks. But because you're able to download it for free and play it, I really don't see this as that big of an issue. Like I don't, I don't see this as anti-consumer necessarily because they're not saying you have to spend $70 on the new game to play it. Because we're shutting down Overwatch 1. They're just saying, no, just come to the free-to-play client and you'll play the same game. You'll have all your stuff that you earned. You'll have all the things that you bought. You're fine. You're there. It, it, that's all you need to do. So you, they're just basically migrating everything to Overwatch 2. So, again, I'm fine with it. Like, I'm, I'm actually okay. Like, I understand. Sh- oh, but yeah. They, think- shouldn't, they shouldn't have said then... Oh yeah, Overwatch two players can uh, play with Overwatch one players. You shouldn't have said that then if you're not gonna if you had issues and weren't able to get that running, which is a problem with a lot of game companies who overpromise and underdeliver. So yeah, yeah, I think um, uh, one of the potential concerns that I could see being being one that could be of legitimate concern is if um, if. And only if mm-hmm. um, Overwatch 2 does something with the requirements that ends up uh, shutting out a lot of people from being able to play, then I could certainly see the concern uh, there because at that point, yeah, just if you've got players who end up basically being unable to play, uh, being unable to play the game because of the new requirements and everything, then yeah, just that that could be a bit of an issue. You mean requirements by like system requirements on PC? Yeah, correct. Yeah, um, I get that, but if that's the case, then the system requirements were probably were going to be bumped up for Overwatch One as well. Like I, yeah. if if that really was going to happen, then there was going to be a giant update on Overwatch One to just basically say, hey, we have to update the system requirements. You need this card. You need this amount of RAM now. So yeah, but Overwatch, they keep fashioning that as a an esports game so i don't think that will be an issue because yeah the, the, with esports games they have to be well optimized for all sorts of systems so i, I don't think that's going to be an issue really but but i understand the, the fear in that i definitely understand that i just look at this and go like look the I get that people, when they have discs, don't like the fact that their discs become coasters after a certain point in time because they just won't work, even if you put them in your system. I get that. I do. 
but this is just basically what gaming has become. And since Overwatch is ostensibly a multiplayer game and always has been, I always felt it weird that people would want to buy the disc anyway for it because you still need an internet connection. You still need to update the game. You still are downloading all the assets. So it was, it's kind of pointless. Like the, the sports games I play, I mean, I, I don't even bother getting the discs anymore because a, you know, multi multiplayer, mostly B, they update it constantly and C, once the year is over, they stop updating and people stop playing it. So it, it was pointless for me to then say, oh, I'll, I'll have the disc version. No, it's a waste of, it's really just a waste of space. So I, I, I don't get it. I think multiplayer only games should just be downloadable at this point. They shouldn't really bother with a disc version. So that, that's me. I know people will disagree. They like to have their collections and they like to have their discs. I get it. But I'm just at that point now where if it's multiplayer only, don't bother with a disc version. Yeah. Uh, moving on. All right, Zero, so we're at the tail end of this episode. But as it is the tail end, I have a question for you. Okay. Now, I cheated on this one because I, I didn't want to surprise Zero with a question that he would have to spend five minutes looking and researching to get an answer from. So I told him beforehand. But since you guys don't know, I'll tell you now. Zero, here's your question. The summer okay. games... The summer game sale is or what, what do they call it is it the summer game sale on steam yeah anyway the whatever. summer game sale so the summer game sale is on steam right now and it's going on till july 7th and since we like to have our viewers save money on games i thought it'd be a good idea for us to talk about what we think are the probably the best deals for the best games that you should jump on so zero what do you think are some good games that people should jump and buy from uh, from the sale? Um, this one, um, I have a really easy answer. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to be Dead Cells. Get the complete edition where you get every single piece of DLC. Um, I think it's ludicrously priced low right now uh, because of the sale and everything. What, what's the uh, price? Uh, let me double check real quick. No. Here. Zero. Eh, it's, it's not that big a deal. Oh, yeah, you're not so editing. The, so. uh, the complete bundle, um, twenty bucks. Twenty bucks. Okay, so, not bad. Like twenty bucks for all the DLC and everything. Yep, and uh, that is a fifty-one percent discount. So, yeah. So um, uh, the total for this bundle is like um, thirty nine ninety six is what Steam is showing uh, as the normal price, but yeah, it's down to nineteen forty eight. That's good, and it's uh, it's a really good price um, for uh, for the bundle because you get all the DLCs. But there's a bigger reason on why I would recommend Dead Cells uh, as the game to buy if you're on a budget and everything. Um, the guys over at Motion Twin um, who developed uh, Dead Cells, they released a huge update. And um, it's it's an accessibility update, which uh, I thought was kind of cool, um, mostly because just um, apparently what the devs um, got for um, inspiration was uh, the game Celeste. Hmm. And for anyone not familiar with Celeste, it's a, it's a um, action platforming game and everything, but what made Celeste so important and so pivotal in the indie game scene is it had a feature called uh, called accessibility modes, and what that let you do is um, it let you custom tune the game uh, to suit um, your difficulty and skill level. So, let's say you're really bad with with um, some of the intense intense and precise jumping mechanisms there uh, there's an option to turn on infinite jumps and hmm. uh, so on and so forth there's just a ton of granular options that you could play with in um in celeste and apparently the guys over at motion twin were really inspired by that and what makes that important is in dead cells there is a a prestige difficulty mechanic that once you beat the game you can uh you can add 
uh, you can add um, uh, boss cells to you, but when you add boss cells, the game becomes much more difficult. Mm. Enemies have more HP. They can uh, they can inflict status effects that that um, tick much more rapidly than usual. Just all sorts of really really challenging things. So this new update is called the Breaking Barriers update. And it just adds a whole bunch of options. Like um, one of the big options that is being added is um, the ability to have infinite lives. Because in Dead Cells, it's a roguelike. So the normal premise is when you die, you die. Yeah. Um, any, any, any cash or upgrades that you have, um, they stick. But if you had any, um, any um, Dead Cells, which are the... Um, uh, organic item that you turn into upgrade your perks and weapons you completely lose those hmm. so um for people who just want to focus on trying to get to the true ending which is i believe you have to set set up um or add four boss cells to to your prisoner and then beat the game with all four cells loaded up on you um that uh, they 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 knew, um, that they basically saw that there was there's a lot of talk from the community that you know hey we're not saying dead cells is bad or it's uh, or anything it's just some of us just don't have the skill to get to the best ending um, uh, because th- this is just starting to get way into the weeds uh, as far as our gaming skill goes. Okay, oh that's cool. Yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. Okay. Uh, anything else? Um, no. I mean, I think that would be my budget pick if if okay. you're kind of strapped for cash and you just want a game with great replay value, but um, also has become very accessible. Then yeah, um, Dead Cells, the complete Road to the Sea bundle uh, for twenty bucks is very hard to beat. Okay, cool. Uh, for a budget pick, I'm gonna say Splunky Two. Uh, it's now ten dollars. Fifty uh, percent off. I know a lot of people were a fan of Splunky One. That I, I don't always hear a lot of people talk about Splunky Two, but Splunky Two is actually pretty good. But if you looked at it and said it kind of looks like Splunky One, but more, so it's not really worth twenty bucks. I think ten is a good price for it. So, and my non-budget picks essentially, uh, Bravely Default Two is thirty dollars right now on Steam. And if you are interested in Monster Hunter at all, Monster Hunter Rise is thirty dollars as well. So that w- those would be my picks. So if you're interested in either of those, if you're interested in RPG or if you're interested in a Monster Hunter, now probably will be the best time for to buy them because that those are decent prices for those games because those very rarely go down unless they're talking about a new Monster Hunter coming out. So yeah, I would I would recommend those specifically. All right, well, on that note, we are at the end of this episode of the Capital Games Podcast. Tune in next week where we discuss more of the going-ons and happenings in the business and culture side of the video game industry. I am The Wiz. And I'm Zero. And we will talk to you next week.